when I, I was developing the ideas that I've been talking about, about moving from what we have at present, which I tend to call knowledge inquiry, to what I think we really need in academia, wisdom inquiry, um, the, the, a moment came when I suddenly realised with a sort of appalling realisation, a kind of, it went clunk, and I realised, my God, this applies to me. Mm. I, this means that I have to take some responsibility for the world, and this is absolutely impossible, because here I am, you know, Nick Maxwell, uh, just a frail individual, and I'm supposed to be taking some responsibility for these, there were probably... Um, a, few, a billion less people around in those days, but it was still a lot of people and a lot going on. Um, and I, and what, what can I do? How can I... Uh, what an unbearable responsibility. And so I began to think about that problem, about how the individual... Uh, how we can do it in a sensible way, you know, because if it is sort of you, to you totally take responsibility, well... Maybe the only thing to do is to go go away and weep in a corner or, or commit suicide, um, and and that's not very helpful. So I thought, well, what what one should be thinking about is sort of five percent of one's effort. You know, some sort of, you know, you we all have lives to lead. You know, we can't kind of abandon our lives. Of course, we might live a life of, of throwing ourselves in into. Um, engaging with these issues. I had a wonderful excuse from doing that. I thought, well, here am I developing an argument uh, as to how we can transform academia so that it becomes uh, actively engaged in helping us to create a better world. Um, OK, no one's listening, but, but I'm throwing it out. I'm publishing books and articles and giving talks. and so I'm doing what I can, so I'm relieved of the rest. So... You know, I can carry on driving my car and uh, and throwing plastic into the oceans. That's well, I never did that. <laughs> um, that so so there was the sort of slight element of uh, using it as an excuse, but I but I, I so I think that it is a big issue, uh, uh, and it, uh, uh, and it needs to sort of be faced, and it needs to be faced realistically, and. Um, it isn't any good thinking that you can act on your own. You have to act with others. I'm sure that's right. I'm not good at acting with others, but I th certainly think that is, is right. Um, and incidentally, I, I, I heard uh, the man, I don't, I've forgotten his name, but he, I think he's probably still in charge of uh, undergra undergraduate uh, teaching education at UCL. And he was talking about this issue in exactly mm. these terms, mm. about, about the need to take on responsibility for the problems of the world, the incredible difficulties, that this should be one of the things that education concerns itself with. Mm. Uh, and new issues arise, which haven't really, in this way, you know, been faced before. I was very impressed, because he mm. absolutely understood it in, mm. in that, those ways. And I have... I have got involved in things. Hmm. Uh, there was a, a few years ago. There was a, a conference that I uh, went to at um, Winchester University, which was about developing trend, green universities, greening universities, hmm. which was interpreted in two ways. One way was we need to be growing more vegetables on uh, campus land and not using so much electricity. And the other way, which seemed to me more important, was uh, about the research and the teaching going on in universities. Um, and we had a sort of joke, uh, and it was linked to the, trans the whole idea of transition towns and transition villages that, mm. that, you know, where they try, and which is a community idea, mm. getting a local community together to take seriously global problems and take seriously the involvement of, of the community. It, it, what can we do? In, how can we change how we live? What, what we do with rubbish and so on, so uh, and our cars and so on. How, how how can we change our lives a bit so that we 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 start doing what really everybody should be doing? Um, and so we had this thing where we were asked a question uh, in this big empty hall, and we had to align ourselves 
how all of us attending the conference, um, how we felt about the answer in terms of whether we were on this side of the wall or in the middle or wherever on the other side of the wall. And one of the questions was, um, what role ought governments to play in helping us to solve global problems? And it was absolutely extraordinary. Everybody, apart from me, clustered <laughs> around absolutely flat against this wall, which said no, no role whatsoever. And I was pressed against, I was the only person pressed hard against the other wall because I firmly believe mm. that a good part of what we have to be doing is, is badgering our government to start doing the things that it needs to do because, because it's, the, you know, without governments, we, we're, we're lost. Mm. Of course we have to do that. And I found it extraordinary that, the, that, these, that so many of the people attending the conference who were actively engaged in transitional movements felt, you know, could feel, could think that, that governments had... Mm. I mean, they were in despair of governments, but mm, uh, that, mm. another thing I used to tell my students was things are too serious for us. I don't know if you remember this remark, too serious for us to be able to afford the luxury of despair or the luxury of pessimism. We have to be, we have to be <laughs> pessimistically optimistic. Um, and the other thing I... I, I, another thing I, I got involved with was, um, you remember the occupation movement that happened a few years ago? Mm. And out of that came something called the Free University. And, uh, and again, there was an ambivalence about what that meant, because one thing it... So we, we invented the Free University, and, and it, we, we, we had courses. Um, and I, I uh, had a seminar. Um, and one thing that it meant for some people was free in the sense of no, that students didn't have to pay. But I thought it should mean free in the sense it was free of all the constraints mm. and dogmas that, that, that constrain yes. orthodox universities. And so I decided I would invent a seminar to explore our fundamental problems. And so it went on, on you know, we, we advertised our, mm. ourselves on, on the internet. Um, and then I thought, um, well, it, it, surely such seminars must exist. You know, this, 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 I know this is the sort of thing mm. that universities tend not to do, but surely mm. there must be some mm. such seminars. So I put um, into Google something like uh, a seminar or uh, our fundamental problems. And the first two items that came up were my seminar, which didn't even exist yet, or had only just mm. existed. Of course, Google does pre-select things just for you, so maybe mm. it wasn't a completely objective test. And I would, I would like someone else to put it into their computer and see what comes up. Mm. And that, that, so that, that, that ran for a time, but it, it, it sort of eventually kind of petered out because... Mm because of a lack of kind of continuity and a lack of place, we would be scattered about in different mm. places. And I, I think it was because of that. Um, I, I, the, but I do remember going down to the, the Bank of Ideas, I think it was called. They occupied a, ba a, a building in the city that um, it was owned by one of the big banks. Um, and, and I was so reminded of the best of the atmosphere of the 60s and the, the friendliness, the enthusiasm of the mm. absolute friendliness was, uh, was wonderful. And I, I think there is this spirit, especially amongst many young people, um, but, but they, they sort of, you know, don't know how, how, to, mm. how to get organised. And, and also, of course, you know, if you're a young person, you have all sorts of other things that you're struggling with as mm. well, as you mm. indicated. Mm get a job and mm. find something worth doing in your job and you won't get a house or anything these mm. days, of course. That's a dream that passed, but you've got mm. to find somewhere to mm. live and mm. <laughs> all these other things. So, but I, I, I think there is much more awareness of, or, you know, when I started out talking about these issues 40 years ago and over, over 40 years ago, People weren't really aware very much of global problems, mm. um, but now, now definitely there is awareness of global problems. How can our human world 
the world as we experience it, uh, the world of people and consciousness and free will and meaning and value, how can this human world exist and best flourish embedded as it is in the physical universe? And I think that is our fundamental problem. It's both the problem of living, because we all want to flourish, mm -hmm. we all want to achieve what is of value in life, um, but it's also an intellectual problem. You know, how do we understand mm. this? How, 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 how does our human world uh, fit into the, the physical universe? Um, and to me, it is a, the, the absolute intellectual scandal of, of universities is that this problem doesn't really get mm. explored. Mm. Um, you know, it gets shunted off to... The, the point about it is that it cuts across all disciplinary boundaries mm. because it's rooted in theoretical physics and in mathematics mm -hmm. um, and it goes right across biology and chemistry and geology and astronomy, cosmology to uh, the social sciences mm. or social inquiry and the humanities uh, and of course it brings in life mm. and the thinking going on in life. Um, so it's so it's Absolutely, so it, it, it includes the whole lot of it. And in my view, an absolutely basic requirement for rationality, for just good, <laughs> decent intellectual inquiry, is that every university should have a kind of symposium um, that meets regularly, mm. that everyone is invited to, and that just explores this fundamental problem mm. or, and the different possible answers and their merits and demerits and and the interplay between this fundamental problem and the more specialized research that's going on in the university and going on elsewhere in, in the, the more specialized scientific research so that it doesn't doesn't just explore the basic problem but also explores the interplay between uh, uh, this this fundamental problem and, and more specialized problem. Um, both in you know the interaction going in both both directions, and and for me the, it's it's the the failure not having this and not having this in our social world either because you know we it, it isn't something that you mm. can open the newspaper and see oh I see there's a there's an article here about our fundamental problem there's a new idea it, how often does one see mm. such a an article in, say, The Guardian, mm. not so often. Um, to me, that that's uh, uh, that that's the the failure to mm. to to take seriously that problem. And and I think the quest the, the problem about what is a value, even quite what we're, what it is we're talking about, is this a factual issue? Is there this a matter mm. of choice mm. or of discovery? Uh, do we think of what is of value in life as a sort of given that we discover, or is it something we create? Uh, is is a is a prof well? This is, I've actually been struggling with this because I'm writing mm. a chapter about it. It's the last. Mm. I'm writing a book called Our Fundamental Problem, and, mm. and it is just mm. directly exploring this question, chapter after chapter. And the penultimate chapter is called What Is a Value and I thought I had all the answers to this, and I find I haven't at all. And uh, things that I've thought before are hopeless. Mm. And I have to be abandoned, and I have to completely rethink everything. I don't and, think people uh, might, and might got a mm, groping. Sorry. So mm. if you have any ideas, yeah. please tell. <laughs> well, a lot of people would, would uh, probably turn to faith or spiritual traditions uh, and say, "Well, what is there here? Can this be examined? Can can aspects of this be?" learn from at least, if not universalized. Well, one of the things I, I think is that what I was talking about earlier with mm. amorative a rationality mm. is absolutely crucial mm. because, because uh, the whole idea of amorative rationality is mm. that we, we need to, when we have problematic aims, as we often do, we mm. need to try to improve them. But in, to, in it, it, the, just raising the question about aim, mm. we're, we're, we're talking about what we want, what we desire, and uh, uh, that means that we need to attend to our desires and our feelings, our emotions. So one of the absolutely crucial things about amorative rationality is it's a kind of synthesis of, mm. of rational, 
traditionally rationalistic consideration mm. and considerations that have to do with desires and emotions. Mm. Um, it's a kind of, um, what I argue in Phenomenology of Wisdom, is a kind of synthesis of mm. traditional rationalism mm. and traditional romanticism, mm. which, which mm. put all the emphasis on emotion and art mm. and imagination and feeling, um, and, and, and is an improvement over both. Mm. Um, because it because for rationalists for rational grounds we need to to bring these things in if you if you re, if you think reason has to do with repressing emotion and desire mm. all that means is that what you do is is driven by emotion and desire and motivation mm. but you you deny yes, it, it you don't yes. know what it is yeah. and very often then it turns out to be mm not of the best, you know, and you see this in science because mm. of one of the phenomena that everyone recognises in science is bitter disputes about mm. who got there first, mm. you know. Well, if you were really interested in the wonders of nature, you wouldn't have these bitter <laughs> yes. disputes. So clearly it's as much as anything else Nobel Prizes that are driving mm. <laughs> scientists' recognition, which is a very understandable thing to want, but, but you know, a bit more honesty might lead to a better way of proceeding. Um, so there is this kind of synthesis, as I put it in my first book, which was published in 1976, called What's Wrong With Science? Mm. I say we need a synthesis of mind and heart so we can develop mindful hearts and heartfelt <laughs> minds. <laughs> and I think that's yeah. probably a good definition, characterization of wisdom as any. And I, so I think amorative rationality seems to me to be crucial to learning uh, about what is the value in life, because because what, what is needed is this synthesis of rationalistic, critical kind of thinking and considerations with, with attending honestly to your mo emotions and, uh, and motivations and, and emotional responses to things. But of course, you know, not everything that feels good is good and not everything we desire is desirable. So we need this interplay of, mm. of thinking and, and, and feeling. And one not, of the great yes. things about the Romantic tradition mm. is the emphasis on, on emotional integrity and motivational integrity. Mm. You know, a lot of literature is about hypocrisy mm. and yeah. Yeah. Uh, how people claim to be doing good and ruining yes. lives right yes. in the centre of thing that still yes. goes on. Um, we, need, we, need, we need to bring the two together. Mm. It, it, it is really the... the I think what I'm arguing for is, is the solution to the two cultures that C.P. Mm. Snow was talking mm. about yeah. all those years yeah. ago, that we'd split off, mm. our culture is split off into what we've inherited from the rationalism of the, mm. the traditional rationalism of the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Mm. And both, you know, if they develop separately, they kind of have a tendency to degenerate. Mm. And, and we really need to put them together mm. again. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you.